Good afternoon. Glad to see so many of you back here, and I know there are a lot of people out in the lobby still uh, engaged in a variety of conversations, but we have uh, one last interesting, exciting panel, and, uh, and then we'll have a reception uh, later this evening. Uh, but I have a, a news flash to uh, share with you, uh, something that just came in, and that is that Senator Lautenberg just uh, introduced a bill to amend the Farm Bill uh, to require a study on the link between soda and obesity. The study, the study, just to keep this really short, would also investigate the, uh, how public health proposals such as price and size interventions would affect obesity. Those, this uh, uh, amendment was uh, endorsed by the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Heart Association, the American Diabetes Association, the American Public Health Association, and of course, Center for Science and the Public Interest. Um, with that, I am very happy to introduce this panel on advocacy and research. Um, I will just very briefly introduce the moderator, Scott Kahan, who is a physician trained in both clinical medicine and public health. He is on the faculties of George Washington University School of Medicine and George Washington University School of Public Health and the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Beyond that, I think Scott's principal claim to fame is that he served as an intern with CSPI a number of years, and we were very happy to share his many talents. Thank you, Scott, and uh, uh, it's all yours. Thank you very much. And Thank everyone for being here. Uh, I, I really want to thank CSBI for putting this on, for all the sponsors, all of the, the panelists here, and especially everybody uh, that came out today and tomorrow uh, to talk about this really important topic. Um, of course, right now what we're going to talk about essentially is how we marry science and advocacy. Uh, and I think we're going to have a really spirited discussion and, and lots of time for uh, Q&A, but of course getting all of us all of us out and back to our homes uh, at a reasonable time. So we're going to start to catch up a little bit here. We have a great panel with multiple perspectives from basic science and clinical science all the way to economic science, public health science, and advocacy and policy. Um, so uh, let's get started. Uh, we have here, let me introduce first, uh, Harold Goldstein, who's the executive director of the California Center for Public Health Advocacy. David Ludwig, who is a practicing pediatrician and researcher in Boston and a professor at Harvard Medical School. Um, Alyssa Basler, uh, who is the CEO of the Illinois Public Health Institute. Lisa Powell, who is a professor of economics at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And Lori Witzel, who is the director of policy research uh, at the American Heart Association. Uh, so why don't we start with, uh, with uh, a little bit of clinical science. Uh, David, uh, where do we stand on the science of sugary beverages uh, and its health effects, and do we really need any more evidence of harm at this point? Right. Well, I'm gathering you want more than just a yes or no. <laughs> I'd like a little discussion. <laughs> okay. um, I think the question is both scientific and also philosophical. Uh, so let's start with science first and then maybe talk a bit about philosophy. The levels of evidence are five, basically. Secular trends, cross-sectional observational studies, perspective observational studies or cohort studies, mechanistically oriented feeding studies, and then ultimately the granddaddy of them all, the randomized control trial, or the RCT. So those are five hierarchical levels of evidence. And one could think of at least five key topics for which each of those levels can be examined. Obesity, of course, diabetes, perhaps there are weight independent effects of sugary beverages on diabetes and on heart disease. Uh, dental caries, for which maybe the evidence is actually the most vigorous uh, cavities. And then fifth could be everything else, the possible uh, increased risk for cancer, gout, and a range of other conditions. Um, so why don't we just focus for a moment or two on obesity. Um, you've heard earlier today that there was a, uh, there's been a, 
a trend toward increasing consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages that overlaps nicely with the prevalence change of obesity that doesn't prove causality, but it's notable. And that with the plateauing and perhaps slight decline in consumption of sugary beverages, especially among children, there has been a plateauing and we hope uh, the beginnings of a decline in prevalence of obesity among kids. Again, that doesn't prove causality. Cross-sectional studies are the weakest kinds of um, ways of approaching this more scientifically. You know, it's asking at any point in time, are the people drinking more soft drinks heavier or lighter than the people drinking fewer sugary beverages? The obvious problem with that is confounding. That it may be that an obese individual in today's environment with the awareness of sugary beverages linked to weight gain has been told by their doctor and been nagged by their spouse to cut down on sugary beverages, might be drinking non-calorically beverages, non-caloric beverages, but they're still obese. Maybe their weight is starting to come down, but they're still obese. So one might actually see the opposite relationship. You know, that just like people with high cholesterol are more likely to be taking a statin. It doesn't mean that the statin is causing the high cholesterol. And so one has to be very cautious. And many of the studies funded by the food industry have used this very weak design and come up with nothing, but it's not a very informative nothing. A stronger design is the prospective observational study or the cohort study, where you follow uh, consumption and, or changes in consumption over time with changes in an outcome. And there have been uh, a few uh, important studies in this area. Um, we, our group published probably the first with children, together with Steve Gortmaker. We looked at uh, about 500 middle school children over two years in the Cambridge, uh, in the eastern Massachusetts area, and we found that, published this about 12 years ago, that every additional serving of sugary beverages a day increased the risk of obesity uh, by 60%, even controlling for other factors and that there was no effect that we saw with diet beverages or other kinds of exposures, suggesting that there might be something very specific with sugary beverages. There have been much larger studies to date involving adults uh, from the nurses' health and the health professionals' follow-up. Typically, the effect size has been smaller, but there's been a consistent effect between increasing consumption and increasing weight gain, decreasing consumption, decrease in weight gain when you have such large databases of tens or even 100,000 individuals, one can make very sophisticated control for a range of other factors that might confound these associations. Then moving onward to more mechanistically oriented studies, going back several decades, uh, researchers over short periods of time have fed selected uh, individuals, volunteers in research studies uh, in one case, 24 ounces a day of either a sugary beverage, which gave about 350 calories, or an artificially sweetened beverage. And they found that during the time that the beverages were, the sugary beverages was being consumed, calorie intake went up. Those calories didn't displace other calories, they added to total calorie intake, and weight actually increased. And that did not occur, or the opposite occurred on the non-caloric beverage condition. Um, there have also been studies that have looked to try to see how a sugar in solid form, like um, uh, jelly beans, yeah, not exactly a health food, but it contains exactly the same single ingredient as a sugary beverage, sugar. It's just in different forms. It seems that even the jelly bean tends to displace calories from other things later in the day, whereas the sugar sweetened beverage does so less well, as if calories, sugar calories in liquid form, slip under the body weight regulating radar system. And then lastly are the randomized controlled trials. Um, and admittedly, the studies are not, for, for this one category alone, they're not considered highest quality level of evidence yet. The, we did a study with obese adolescents. There have been some randomized cluster designs in England and Brazil and more studies are coming along, they all tend to show effects um, on um, uh, body weight that are predominantly 
limited to the overweight and obese groups, not the lean groups. But that's not so surprising because it's not as if sugar-sweetened beverages is keeping a lean individual from becoming anorectic and underweight. We clearly could understand that there will be individuals who are more and less susceptible to the weight gaining effects of sugary beverages. In fact, one line of evidence is to try to identify them. It doesn't mean that there are, there are of course, some people who can drink a lot of sugary beverages and not gain weight. Um, there are people who smoke and don't get lung cancer. Um, doesn't mean that the smoking is good for their heart, nor does it mean that the sugary beverages are good for health for a lean person. But this is an interesting area of evolution. So I, I think that we can now move to philosophy, which is what is the level of evidence necessary to recommend a public health change? And to do that, you need to balance upsides and downsides. I think the downsides, for example, in the campaign in the 1970s and 80s of just decreasing fat intake across the board was launched prematurely, in my opinion. We now know that there are healthful fats and there are unhealthful fats. There are healthful carbs and there are, are sugar-sweetened beverages. Um, and so we launched into a low-fat campaign that may have taken, the, taken our eyes off the mark for other more important drivers of body weight. But what's the downside of eliminating sugar-sweetened beverages? I mean, there really are none. Clearly, even if it's not a major determinant of body weight, and I actually believe that it is, that we can make a strong case, there's, there's also evidence for an independent link to diabetes, heart disease, possibly cancer, certainly dental caries, probably gout. So what's the downside of taking action at the 95% confidence level rather than the 99% confidence level. You know, in the case of, one could say, it's like global warming. You know, do you want to wait to see the waters rising from the Potomac, you know, you know in Washington, before you take action? You know, yes, at that point, you have 100% confidence that global warming is affecting um, ecology, but, um, but it may be too late. Do we want 10 or 100,000 or a million unnecessary um, illnesses and deaths before we're willing to take action. And I think that, in my view, the evidence is incomplete, and we absolutely need more research, and a strong, a very strong case can be made for public health action now. And so, Laurie, uh, why is policy research so important, given what, what David is saying here, that we have such essentially solid uh, clinical evidence? Scott. So I would say that policy research is the, you know, this is what I do every day in my work. So I translate our science at the American Heart Association into policy. And um, sometimes we have greater evidence than other times. And David is right that we are, you know, it, this, this science will continue to evolve and it will continue to inform our policy efforts. But it has to be, the science in my mind has to be the foundation for all of our work in policy. I can speak from the American Heart Association's perspective. It is our currency on the Hill. It is our currency in state capitals. It's our currency with policymakers because we don't give large donations to, uh, to, to politicians. We can't do that as a 501c3 organization. And um, we don't have a, a large constituency like an ARP that would you know, grab the attention of a policymaker. So for us, our currency on the Hill is our science. And so we. Um, are very careful often to move forward in policy with, without that evidence base. However, there are times when it makes sense. Like there's common sense that, that drives us in our policy work. And, and there are many cases here in sugar sweetened beverage policy where that's the case, where we may support pilot work to give us more evidence or to, to kind of inform our efforts even more. And I think um, I would say that sugar sweetened beverage taxes are one of those instances. Some of the other work that we're doing in this area would fall into that category for us. We're, we want to get out there and we want to see in a pilot basis what works. Also in our policy research, we have to think creatively about unintended consequences. Make sure that we've thought those through. And sometimes they're hard to foresee. Um, and sometimes we can maybe creatively think about what they could be. But that's all an important part of our work. And so you mentioned uh, soda taxes, and clearly that's a, a, an important policy area. Um, Lisa, w what's the evidence base for the effectiveness of soda taxes, and what new research might be uh, helpful? Right. So what we know now, um, there are a number of studies that have been done uh, by numerous economists and other policymakers looking at the demand uh, for soda 
for sugar sweetened beverages, for individual types of SSBs like regular carbonated soda or sports drinks. And generally what the findings have been to date is that uh, if you were to put a tax of say 20%, you would expect roughly a 16% reduction in demand. And that was based on soft drink. And the recent evidence that we've been actually just recently reviewing from published between 2007 and actually March when we finished our review actually suggests that the demand for SSBs is even higher, that is that it's price elastic, that a 20% tax would actually lead to about a 24% reduction in consumption of SSBs. But the question then becomes, translating this to weight outcomes, it becomes, well, to what extent might individuals substitute to other beverages, not just other beverages, but potentially also other foods? Um, so really well, the question is, what's the change in net caloric intake and hence perhaps a change in body weight? And there have been a number of studies that have linked food prices, more so on fast food prices, that have found significant changes where price would change consumption, which changes weight outcomes. Um, a couple of studies that have used taxes instead of prices for SSPs or soda taxes. And one of the, the general finding there is that the... Sorry, is the mic on? The mic isn't on. Probably the rest of us should turn on. Is this one working? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so the the evidence for consumption, as I was saying, for those who couldn't hear, is, is there's a fairly large um, and developed base where essentially in the SSB uh, price elasticity, which is the extent to which consumption would change for a change in price, has been estimated to be what we call elastic in economics, meaning that if, for example, there was a 20 percent uh, uh, tax that increased price by 20%, there would be about a 24% reduction in consumption. So the question then becomes, what about cross-price effects? What are people going to substitute towards, not just with respect to other beverages, but even foods, because foods can be, other foods can be complements or substitutes to SSB consumption. So there have been a couple of studies that have looked at the effect of taxes, soda taxes that currently exist at the state level, but these taxes are fairly small and what they've found is that there's a pretty small effect on weight, but that's not surprising since the range of those taxes is between zero and seven percent, so you could not expect to find a particularly large impact. So what we really need to do to move the evidence base forward is we need to link pricing, but not just of soda, but of SSBs in general, because soda is only one component of the SSB umbrella. So we need to have developed measures of pricing. We need to follow individuals over time, because most of the studies to date have been cross-sectional. We need to control for unobserved other state-level effects that can be going on if we're looking at pricing across states. But if we could gather more precise information about pricing that's happening in the neighborhood that individuals live at, we could exploit that and link it to individual consumption. And we don't want to know just do you consume or do you not consume or do you consume twice a day. We really want to gather data that, for example, are in NHANES on the number of calories that are being taken in because the concern really is at the upper tail of the distribution of heavy SSB consumption because if we can change that kind of behavior that's where you're going to see the translation into weight. What we also need is we need evidence for different groups. So for example, for other risky behaviors such as smoking and alcohol, the evidence shows that youth are more price sensitive. Well, youth are the biggest consumers of SSBs in the US. So they also have less money than adults do. So if you're spending a higher percentage of your income on something, you tend to be more price sensitive because a change in uh, dollar impact on a youth is gonna be more than a change for an adult who has a larger budget. If we can change those consumption patterns, we can expect to hopefully change the long-term type of consumption that they actually habituate over time as they grow in uh, to adulthood because we know that these types of behaviors uh, track as does um, obesity. So really what I would like to see are studies that can look at consumption. A lot of the consumption studies even show at the household level because they use aggregated household level data. So if we could get price sensitivity on youth, on different groups by income, uh, uh, that would be particularly um, helpful. And we need to be able to do this in a longitudinal uh, framework, which we haven't really been able to do to date. How do you respond to the, to the message that soft drink taxes penalize the poor? 
So this is something that is brought up um, frequently, and indeed it was the same sort of to go back to tobacco, the same type of argument. But when you think about price sensitivity, if you have a lower budget, you tend to be more price sensitive because price matters more. So while um, you could think about the fact that if you're more price sensitive, you would actually change behavior more. So if you're lower income and you have a higher price sensitivity, you would have greater behavior change and actually benefit more health-wise for those low-income individuals who continue to engage in the behavior, such as buying the sugar-sweetened beverages or buying cigarettes that have taxes, then indeed you're going to be um, paying a higher burden. Taxes are, by nature, regressive, consumption taxes. On the other hand, one of the nice things about a SSB tax is that actually it garners revenue. And you could turn around and take that money and put it back, for example, into a uh, fruit and vegetable subsidy that would offset the regressive nature of the tax. Or perhaps into new areas for research into... Oh, a uh, whole host of areas. I'm absolutely. sure that there's going to be no short of ideas for those tax dollars. And on that note, um, Alyssa, what, what are new areas of research that would be most helpful for advocacy efforts to reduce SSB consumption? Well, I think, um, I, I, you know, I'd like to sort of speak from my experience of having talked, for instance, about sugary beverage taxes. And the, so some of the research, I think, needs to be um, somewhat sort of in the marketing, public opinion, what sorts of messages resonate because the, the questions you get back are, are sort of the nanny state questions. So how can, what, what sorts of messages around things like uh, Mayor Bloomberg's proposal or uh, a tax on sugary beverages resonate with different groups of people in terms of being able to sort of counter that nanny state and, and make the case as um, the director of public health from New York made this morning that it's there's a duty of government. How do you how do you frame that message to people in order to to get uh, get at this? I think the other area I think that's really goes along with what Lisa is talking about um, are these issues of economics. So the other argument that I often hear back, I, I can tell you some really nasty emails that I get when I talk about on the radio about sugary beverage taxes, but um, is is why should I pay? for somebody else's bad habit, right? That's, that's a real, I'm not overweight, why should I pay, why, are, why, why should I pay? And, and I think that one of the things that I like to try to talk about is that you're already paying, right? The cost of obesity in our society, the cost of health care, we're all absorbing that. It's very, it's, it's really coming out of your pocket in another way. And if there were ways to make that real concrete for folks and say, um, your, um, your your contribution, what, what it costs you in excess health care costs as an individual, not just the $147 billion we know that it costs the United States health care system, would be very helpful to be able to sort of say, you're paying, it's really already paying for it, and you really want people to stop drinking those so that you don't have to pay for it. So that's another sort of area of economics that maybe you can help with. Um, and then I think that the, um, the, the other, um, concern that, that people raise are concerns about jobs. So I think these are lots of economic arguments. And then the last one I wanted to actually point out, what you just said about reinvesting the dollars back in to um, prevention. We have some very generic descriptions of the um, economic multiplier effects, I guess you would call it, of prevention. So if we could talk about, well, if you took those dollars and um, you know taxes are always framed as a drag on the economy, right, and the drag on people's pocketbooks, and could talk about how reinvesting those dollars in prevention um, would have an impact on the economy, on uh, both on poor people who would have the best health benefit from having having prevention services or something in their communities, but also how what what sort of the net uh, benefit of prevention? We used to in early childhood talk about a dollar in Head Start saved you know like four dollars or six dollars down the road in um, you know other kinds of costs, and it would be it would be great to have even more concrete than that examples of how if you put money into um, in improving the built environment or um, improving um, providing food ac better food access in communities and so on that that would the effect the economic effects of that prevention that would be great to have uh, Harold can you give us some concrete real world examples from your experience of the effective use of research in the policy arena 
Sure. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. I, I just want to note the difference in tenor of this session and when Todd was talking, right? <laughs> so this is so often what it's like when you have the marketing industry versus public health folks. We public health folks are here and we talk about our science and what's, what's the level of evidence that we need before we act. And what do, what do the marketers do? They figure out how to grab people's hearts. Isn't that what he said? Grab your heart and bring it to me, right? <laughs> and so I think, it, especially amongst all of us who are doing this work day to day, is to remember, is to find the right balance. And my guess is for each of us, we have the right balance. When, when Kelly Brownell says, and I know David believes too, there is rock solid evidence of the link between soda consumption and obesity, right? Um, the average American drinks, what is it, 45 gallons of soda a year. That's 42 pounds of sugar a year. That's how much my son weighed when he was five years old. So on average, we all consume a five-year-old's worth of soda a year, right? And I- That really grabbed our heart and brought us to There you, you are. <laughs> <laughs> I have a three-year-old. That's right. He's not, he's, you, you can have a three-year-old twins every year. Um, we just did some public opinion polling in Richmond, actually, and the most compelling argument, um, so this is a form of science, right? Ask people on the messaging side of things. Um, the best of the anti-tax arguments and the best of the anti-soda pro-tax arguments and amongst all of them, by far the most compelling argument was, listen to this, a can of soda has 10 teaspoons of sugar and is a leading contributor to the obesity epidemic. That was far and that was a very convincing argument for taxing sodas. And when people heard these kinds of arguments, um, even folks, or a certain segment, the, the volatile segment of, of folks in Richmond um, whose opinions could change, went from slightly opposed to strongly in favor, right? How much research did it take? Not all that much. It's just the basics of here's what soda is. So I just want to um, kind of put a, some perspective on the science and how much science we need. And I'm a strong supporter of science. I mean, I think we want to make sure that what we do is beneficial and isn't harmful. Um, I mean, real life example, a couple real life examples. Um, getting soda and junk food out of school in California. So it took six years to get soda and junk food out of school so, um, between 1999 and 2005. Um, the research, I should say, in probably 50 legislative hearings that I testified at, how many times did a legislator ask what the evidence was that getting soda and junk food out of schools would reduce obesity? How many would you guess? Zero. None. Not once. The reason soda and junk food were taken out of school was not about science. It was about morality and ethics. Is it right for schools to be selling products that we know are unhealthy? Yeah? And still, we wanted to have some science. The science that was most compelling, I think, was when we looked at childhood obesity rates by state legislative district. Yeah? So we gave every state legislator, we did it twice over the course of, of um, three years, um, every state legislator their childhood obesity rates. Then we showed that every legislative district three years later had higher obesity rates. We released that study a week before the final vote on the school nutrition bills. And those bills passed by one, two, three votes. Yeah, It's a use of science to show policymakers what is really happening in their communities. And as a result, the media ended up being advocates. They would call legislators and say, I see you've got this rate of obesity. What are you going to do about it? And I understand there's going to be a vote on getting soda and junk food out of schools next week. How are you going to vote on it? Um, on the menu labeling bills, um, so California became the first state in the nation to, to require menu labeling. That was in 2007, 2008. The science that seemed most compelling was a, um, um, a junk food quiz 
that we put together and had um, done as a public opinion poll. And we asked four questions, you know, you go to Denny's and you choose this, 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 or this, which has more calories, right? Um, something like 60% of people got all four questions wrong, and I don't think there was a single person um, that got all the questions right. And what it showed was just the reality that people have no idea what they're eating, how many calories there are, how much sodium, um, just by the name on the menu, right? That information was helped to convince people or to show people that they had a right to know what's in their food before they buy it. Hard science on will menu labeling reduce obesity or not, not necessarily. Again, it wasn't on that policy. What it was about was a consumer right to know. Yeah. So it's a balance of all of these things. Again, we don't want to implement policies that are um, counterproductive. Um, on this, I think on, on sugary drinks, we know this stuff is, is bad for people. The science is certainly sufficient. Um, so the questions then are about which policies are going to be most effective. And I think there are some really important questions on messaging and how do we, how do we convey to different communities, different ethnic communities, even questions about are there different messages in different regions and to different communities so that we can collectively learn how do we best convey information that we in the public health community know, how do we convey that effectively um, to different groups? And who the best spokespeople are, it's likely not us doing the conveying. It's who are, who are the, the folks who are going to be trusted in communities. Can I just add something? So uh, sort of what I was saying too, right? I mean, I need to know how to make the argument for the policy and to, and to do the advocacy. But I hear you've done some polling. I heard earlier about um, CSPI or somebody else, other people who've done polling. And one of the things that would be helpful is if that was gathered somewhere, right? We don't, uh, we shouldn't all reinvent the wheel and do more polling and, and nobody has enough money to do all of that. So it would be very helpful if, CSPI or some other national organization, you know, would sort of create some sort of clearinghouse that would tell us what sorts of messages resonate. I say the 10 teaspoons per can of soda all the time, and I, and I, and I, and I do the, you know, would you ever go into Starbucks and put 10 teaspoons of sugar right. in your coffee? No. So, uh, you know, I mean, I asked that question. I didn't know it was a good one. I didn't know I was doing a good job of messaging. It just makes sense to me. So it would be really helpful to have that kind of information someplace where we, the polling that has been done would, would be shared. I, you know, in the, in the tobacco fight, I mean, there was tons and tons of, you know, message testing and so on that was available to advocates, and we need that. So let me just say that we, because of the need for it, we've put together a website, and there's information um, outside about it called Kick the Can. And kickthecan.info, we have some postcards that we can be passing around. Um, KickTheCan.info is designed to be the clearinghouse of all of this. We have um, all the polling that's been done across the country, messaging, um, the, the kind of critical uh, studies that have been done, the reports, and we want to know from you what else could be on um, Kick the Can videos, everyone, the, the um, pro uh, soda tax videos, the beverage industries videos. Um, so it's, a, it's designed to be something for all of us to use and a living website. So if you go on and you see that there are um, documents, materials that aren't on it yet, please send them in to us and um, we will keep building that as the clearinghouse for the movement. That we're he, he hardly paid me anything That's to ask right. that question. <laughs> So if, if we're sort of trying to start now to build what the key messages are, the key talking points that will keep bring, bringing this issue forward, um, w what are your thoughts on what those might be? Are we, should we be focusing more on health effects, obviously um, uh, framing it in, in, a, in, a, in a way that, that really resonates with people? Should we be focusing on, on protecting children's health, perhaps on addiction, perhaps on morality and so forth? Uh, what are your thoughts on that based on your experiences? I think, first of all, I think we need to segment our advocacy efforts here because we're, we're mixing and matching a little bit. 
So when we talk about advocacy, there's a you know there's policy research, which is the foundation of what we what we do, and then we um, have to develop our media advocacy campaign, our messaging. We have to develop our grassroots campaign, how we reach, how we use our grassroots networks. And I think between all of us in the room, we have tremendous grassroots reach, and we need to at some point mobilize and take advantage of that. And then we need to use our, our, um, our legislative lobbying as well. So we need to get to policymakers and talk to them. So, um, so those are all very key strategies. It should be part of whatever policy strategies we choose to prioritize on sugar-sweetened beverages. Um, as far as messaging, that takes, you know, that takes real expertise and you have to do the research on, on what, can, what messages resonate most. We've had some real experiences, uh, you know, tobacco, we always go back to tobacco as our, our best model with the most evidence base so far. But, um, but we know, for instance, in our clean indoor air work, our smoke-free air law work, that, um, you know, giving employees the right to, to breathe uh, smoke-free air was the most resonating message for us. That's in our polling, that's what we found was the most re resonating message. So um, the right to breathe clean air was our message and that resonated very well. I don't know what it will be with sugar-sweetened beverages, but we have to find that out. Well, and I, I actually think that there's a, there's a, not on taxes for sure, but even on a, a variety of other policy areas, there's, there's this level uh, in, the whole sort of population of lack of understanding and knowledge, right? So there's like this ground softening work that needs to be done. I don't know exactly what, you know, what other words, but we need to be out there talking with even, even our partners and our coalitions and so on sort of aren't really ready to dive in and, and, and engage on, you know, fully on the sugary beverage uh, campaigns and certainly not on sugar beverage taxes. They're very hesitant. The, so, so I think there's, a, a, there's this, this level of education that is reliant on the science about the health effects that the general population doesn't know and is, so aren't ready to engage on and why you get the government nanny stuff back, right? Because there, people just don't understand how harmful that is, maybe how manipulated we are by the marketing of the beverage industry and so on. So I think that there's some just grassroots education. I think the hospital work that uh, has been done in Boston and some other places where the health care provider world are being leaders and saying, you know what, we recognize this isn't good for you. We've seen the science because we're in health care and we're going to start to remove those. We're not going to put those out there and we're going to start to talk to people about it. I think that sort of opinion leader work and healthcare seems like an obvious place, and that was when tobacco too is an is an important component of this. Yes, so that's absolutely true. That we've been doing a lot of work on the change in hospital systems and helping to support that work, and it's it's a tremendous effort. Um, and a couple of things there. You know, one thing we just learned recently with an agreement, uh, there was a certain hospital system that we were working with that was going to take full calorie beverages out of their hospital system. Great work, and Coca Cola got upset about that initiative and contacted those hospital executives and wanted to have a meeting. And uh, so we helped, you know, we talked with the folks there about what that meeting, how that meeting was probably going to go and what was going to be said. And um, I just read the brief from the meeting notes this morning and, you know, this is where, um, you know, this work that we're going to do here is going to take tremendous spine, as we know, uh, and there's going to be such tremendous, tremendous industry pushback. We, we have to be prepared for that. And I, I was really interested in one of the requests that industry made of that hospital system, and it was this. Could we bring, um, could we do some educational seminars for your hospital staff around diet sodas? And so I thought that was very interesting. And it's telling because I think it's one of the areas of science that we need to, we need more evidence on. What is the link between diet soda and obesity? And wait, and, and, and this is going to be critical because are we then, are we advocating as for diet soda to be an alternative to full calorie beverages in our policy work? Um, are, are those beverages okay in SNAP versus full calorie beverages? So this is an area, where, this is just another example where industry I think is on top of this, this question, and they're going to start to, you can imagine, try to educate healthcare professionals around this issue from their perspective, and we need to be ready to do it from our perspective with the science. Let me say, if I say two things on messaging. Um, one is, I, I, I think there are two main um, kind of cutting edge policy worlds. One is getting sodas out of hospitals, 
um, city facilities, after school programs, kind of the places where soda is sold. Um, and for that, the message is that these places shouldn't be contributing to the obesity epidemic by selling these products. In the same ways that schools shouldn't be, for the most part, aren't selling these products, cities shouldn't be selling them either. Hospitals shouldn't be selling them either. And um, in California, at least, that's, it's a growing and effective message um, for getting um, cities, for example, out of the soda business. On soda taxes, I think the, it's important to talk about where the money could be used. When I've talked to a city councilman, for example, you know, I can show my soda and I could talk about my six-year-old kid. And, and one, one woman said to me, a city councilwoman from, um, from Sacramento, she said, I just don't like how you're wagging your finger at me. And I said, have I been wagging my, right? But it came across as, it's just like Todd was saying, people don't like being told what not to do. And I, and I changed the topic entirely and I said, well, City of Sacramento would be about $20 million a year. What, what would you like to spend $20 million on? And her entire demeanor changed. And she then started putting me in touch with different people and she wanted to spend it on after school programs and, and um, community gardens. And it's a very different conversation to talk about what's wrong with soda. We need some of that, of course, but to also engage people about what kind of community do we want for our kids, what kind of services are now being cut um, that would help keep our kids healthy. And for every community, on, this is on the soda tax policy, which I think is the other big one, um, for people to be thinking about how could these tax revenues be used to address the obesity and diabetes epidemics and create communities to keep our kids healthy. Can I add something to that? Is this, is this mic on? Oh. Um, so actually, both Alyssa and I, Alyssa and I were at the, um, Chicago was holding some meetings, uh, and there were some aldermen there, and they were, you know, they had a lot of concerns about uh, you know, the community, uh, the shopkeepers were worried about sales going down, and, and you know, some of them had Coke giving money to develop certain things in their communities. So if Coke can, in, a, in some sense, almost sort of, you could think of, say, buy them off because they're giving them money, well, the tax revenue <coughs> can do the same thing. And what we think we really need to do is pass that tax revenue on because it takes political guts to vote for it, but in return, then that alderman or that you know, congressperson can actually get credit for the programs that they spend the money on so that then they are doing something for their community and let them take the kudos for that. Uh, and then you'll see them, I think, be much more uh, on board so that they are giving back to their uh, community. And, yeah. and there's a lot of, you know, so that if people think, well, wow, you've built us a uh, playground or you've created bike paths or you've done this and you've brought that, um, I think that the conversation will change very quickly. A penny an ounce tax is a lot of money for every city regardless of the size. A city of 10,000 people, that's a lot of money. What is a million dollars or something? A large city, that's even more money. But per capita, it's a significant amount of money. And it's meaningful. And to engage people in that conversation very different than having think, their finger wagged. And I think, but I think that's a really important question, though, too, because as we learn from tobacco, oftentimes those taxes are used for something other than, you know, prevention or obesity, you know, obesity prevention or some other kind of health program that we'd like to see. So this is the ultimate question that we have to answer: Are we willing to support a tax if if the dollars aren't going to that kind of funding? And, and that's a key question for us to answer. And we had to answer it in tobacco, and we did, as, as an association we did, but that's something as a public health community we have to decide on. I think that's really important. I think that that was sort of the big missed opportunity of tobacco, right, was, was that those funds did not go into prevention. And so certainly in the work that we're doing um, in Illinois, we won't talk about the, to the, the sugary beverage tax without also talking about a prevention fund. They have to be linked, and because where tobacco, if you, just, if you just reduce consumption of tobacco, you, you do a lot to solve the tobacco problem, but just reducing sugary beverages is not enough. Obesity is a much more multifaceted you know, problem. And so 
the, the, the environmental issues that we need to deal with, the, the food access issues that we need to deal with, the food in schools, the PE in schools, and all of those other kinds of things that we need to deal with that are part of the solution to obesity. If we just pass sugary beverage taxes and we don't solve the obesity problem, then we're really screwed, excuse me. And, and so, right, Feel so- Feel free to tweet that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, I mean, we'll, we will have lied, right? We will have made uh, uh, promises we can't keep. And, and the only way to make sure that we keep the promise of, a t uh, of the tax is to make sure that we make those other kinds of investments that we know work. And again, I'll go back to what research is needed evidence about what interventions work and, and uh, on a big scale and how, how those, the, the investments in prevention will have an effect are the other piece of it, especially around the sugary beverage tax discussion. Yeah, I also think we have to watch out about the overpromise. I don't know that anybody wants to say that by passing a sugary drink tax, we're gonna solve the mm -hmm. obesity epidemic and we're gonna fund everything that needs to be funded. Um, one of the great benefits of the advocacy work that goes on um, whether a, a policy passes initially or not is the education that goes on through the advocacy process. And so it might be a while before there's a soda tax passed, but you can be sure that the discussion around soda taxes is doing more right now to get information out about how unhealthy sodas are and how much sugar there is in, in, in beverages than probably anything else. Because the first question anybody would ask about a soda tax is, well, why in the world would you tax soda instead of something else? And it turns out, we all know, there's some really good answers to that question. Yeah, that's, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's, it's that process that begins to affect social norms, and, mm -hmm. and that's what we're ultimately trying to change here is, is a social norm. So why don't we open it up to questions now so that we have the opportunity before a couple of our panelists have to leave. Are there any uh, questions out there for the group here? Hi, I have more of a comment than a question. This is Lisa Crapo from Samuels and Associates in California. And I just wanted to talk about uh, another kind of evidence that we've collected in California, primarily sponsored by the California Endowment, and that's public opinion polling around support for not only soda taxes, but the number of other policy strategies we can use to reduce um, access and exposure to sugar-sweetened beverages. And what we found is that in the public, there's overwhelming support for these strategies. And even when you go to taxes, there is support, and the support goes way up when you do a follow-up that, well, if the money's gonna be used specifically to promote children's health, would you support this? And the public does. And interestingly, we've also found that there's really strong support among policymakers, and even among conservative policymakers, of course, taxes, there's less support, but you know, they're not that far below the 50% mark, which, you know, all we need is 51%. Thank you. There's a question back there. Hi. Um, is it working? Yes, now it is. Or sort of. Um, I'm Deb Spicer with the New York State Department of Health, and my, my question refers to a comment that Dr. Farley made this morning about uh, a, an attack that the industry often uses that sugary drinks are only 7% of calories. And he went on to talk about, you know, that's 140 a day, and we know that 140 a day is big, but 7% of the public is very small. So I would just challenge, I think that that figure in the denominator includes people who don't drink sugary drinks. Yes. And so I really would challenge you guys in the research area to Give us the figure for the percentage of calories that sugary drinks represent among those who drink, and which is going to be a higher figure, and that we all agree to use that, because I think it'll be a little bit more potent. Right. I, I agree with that. I always say, first of all, I say, because 7% sounds so very little, I say, you know, that's like one in every 15 calories you consume, right? I mean, that sounds bigger, I think, somehow than 7%. And then the other thing I say, and I don't drink sugary drinks. So somebody else, it's 14%, because I'm not counted in that. And so I think that there's ways of actually better than, than you know, talking about denominators and numerators to people to sort of demonstrate what average means and what, and what we're really talking about here, which is the people, you know, the meat, you know, there's, there's, this isn't about the average. I also think there's a, there's a real misconception about how many more calories Americans are consuming that's resulted in the obesity epidemic. It'd be an interesting polling question, right? I would guess that 
most people would say that Americans are consuming five, six, seven, eight hundred more calories per day. And it's just not true. Between 1977 and 2001, the average American is consuming 278 more calories per day. That completely explains the obesity epidemic. So maybe some change in physical activity, debatable actually. Uh, 278 more calories per day completely explains the obesity epidemic. And of that 278 calories, 120 of those are new soda calories. So 7% was how many calories, you say? What was he, what was he 140. saying? 140. 140 calories. I mean, if, if Americans are consuming 120 new beverage calories over the last 30 years, that, that could easily be half of the entire obesity epidemic. But you've just made a very complicated, rational argument. I don't think it's going to resonate with the public. Because the public yeah, that's why I bring my jar of sugar. I was only saying it to you, and I talk about my six-year-old kids. <laughs> Well, I think an, another. They represent twenty percent of their. But it only goes. Up, it goes up to something like eleven percent or something, right? I mean, it's still not going to be. It's not going to be half of all the calories Americans consume come from beverages. No, right? but I mean, I think you know. We just got to be looking gotta, at it from a public's perception, because the, the industry is going to come back and back and back with that seven yeah. percent. Well, and we know, can't give a complicated you know, defense of something. I think the answer to that is, is how much sugar it is. People don't know percentage this, percentage that, but uh, I understand what you're saying, but are you telling me that you put 22 packets of sugar in that 20 ounce beverage and, and you want people to drink that every time they're thirsty? You wouldn't eat that on anything else. I mean, I think there are ways of describing that doesn't buy into their argument about what the percentage is. I also think this ties into a larger issue in that um, I think the best way we could go about this for now in the early stages of this whole issue is to, to take this, take a real state and local approach with this because it makes it much harder for industry uh, to combat. And so, um, you know, these local initiatives and state initiatives that could be underway will, will be the testing ground, the proving ground, and it's, it's, it's you know, it's what we did in tobacco as well. Um, but it's also going to build that groundswell, change social norms, and, and give us the strength we need to move forward, you know, eventually perhaps on a federal level, but we're not there yet. I would also just add that, um, you know, focus just on calories can, you know, is very popular in the industry. It makes the 100 calorie pack look great, right? Just 100 calories. Of course, people eat two or three of them, and that, that doesn't even take into account the impact later in the day of eating that hyper-processed food, that you may wind up being excessively hungry and eating 50% more dinner because your blood sugar surged and crashed. I think the, the focus is on that the, not all calories are alike from a metabolic perspective, and that the quality of the calories matter tremendously when it comes to our health outcomes. And I um, don't know that we need to go down the rabbit hole of arguing you know, the in industry will argue it's just 7%. That, that, let them make that argument. You know, we can make the argument that, you know, okay, it's a 7% 7, it's a 7 that's increasing the risk of obesity in kids by 60%. So I have a, a question, um, Jim Krieger from Seattle, which is getting to how we bring our partners along in other sectors in the procurement issue. So hospitals, schools, youth-serving programs. The biggest barrier they perceive is revenue loss. And so I'm wondering what the researchers or research can tell us to sort of document what is the impact on a small business, on a school, on a hospital if they, if they get rid of the sales of sugar-sweetened beverages. You hear little snippets here and there from small pilot studies that say revenues dip for the first sometimes two months, sometimes six months. Then they go back to baseline again, but I haven't seen any clear evidence on that, and that would be very helpful in terms of rolling this stuff out with, with uh, other partners like that. Well, I think actually we shouldn't also tell them to just focus on revenue from the beverages. We should also frame it as you're going to have a productivity gain because your, your staff and the people who work for you are not going to be taking as many sick days. Uh, you're going to have substantially lower uh, medical cost coverage. So I think that we need to also move it away from 
revenue, but I think it also comes back to this question about substitution. People are going to drink something, so you could offer them water. So the only revenue loss is going to be if the substitution is 100% towards fountain water that's provided, because then people will not be purchasing that. It would be provided for free. Um, so they will buy other drinks. So it gets back to the same question about industry says, well, there's going to be job loss. And we've just finished a study on that and show that, well, actually, people will still buy other things. And as was mentioned earlier today, the trucks will transport other types of beverages. And if people, even if they drink some more water, they will then buy something else. Maybe they'll buy a pair of Levi's or they'll spend some more money on housing, which would really help the economy. <laughs> so um, we found that there's no job loss. And that, you know, I'm not going to say more than that because I don't want to sort of get into that study. But, um, so I think it's the same thing in the hospital is to also try to frame all of the things. And I think, um, you know, starting my days as a labor economist before I got into health, and I've done some studies on obesity um, and labor market outcomes, and there's some very large ties there, um, generally just in terms of productivity. Uh, and so I think that that needs to be incorporated um, in, in as well. So there's other sort of costs. So I think we need to have a very a more comprehensive um, framework and maybe help all employers have that comprehensive framework and maybe build it for them. I want to go back to something that Harold said, though. This is not, this is a moral issue, right? This is not an, an ethical issue. It, it isn't an issue of a few dollars. So we've just been doing some case studies with one of um, Dr. Powell's um, colleagues and everyone said, with schools and on competitive foods, and, and they, most, most of the people that we talked to said, you know, maybe the money went down a little bit. Maybe we got more money in our school lunch program, but less in our competitive foods. But you know what? It was all worth it. It was really important for us not to be selling this stuff to our kids. And that is what mo motivated and moved these schools. And that's the story we're going to be able to tell. And that gets me to stories. So the same hospital group that Lori is talking about um, that met with Coke, and I was in that meeting. It was very interesting. Um, we met a woman uh, at one of the hospitals. This actually, her, her story starts actually in changing a lot of food environment as well as the beverage environment in that hospital, who, without even thinking about it, without doing anything different, had lost like 60 pounds. And she talks like an evangelist about it. And so these, the, the, the stories, the real stories of the effect on your own employees, on people's employees, and what their, their appreciation for their employer for, for making those kinds of changes and how much better she feels. And they're a self-insured company. And you know they, they're, they're smart business people, right? They can figure out, well, that's one employee. That's a great story. That's moving your heart. Right, and that's one of the other things that we need in the in from sort of researchers. Uh, or maybe it's not research, but that's one of the other things that we need are real people's stories about how changing their behaviors have made these kinds of difference. And if we want to get at the name, we're talking about this in the elevator. The thing that Todd talked about was all about wasn't about sort of telling people or, or anti sugar. It was pro carrots. And I, you know, how do we get the anti-sugar story? And I think some of the tobacco ads that are out there now with the people with, you know, um, uh, what do you call them? You know, tracheotomy. they, tracheotomies and 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 breathing through tubes and all of those kinds of things. You know, let's start. If we really need to do it, then let's start showing people who've lost limbs to diabetes and so on because that, you know, and, and start making those kinds of move people's hearts stories as well. I do so, want to just underscore Jim what you're saying because I, yeah. I think it would be helpful. Uh, to be able to show businesses that they're not going to lose very much money. Um, in California, there was a, a study very early on in the school food um, fights, um, which showed that schools weren't going to, that low income schools were going to make more money, high income schools broke even, maybe lost a little bit of money. That was enough science. I mean, it was 14 school districts, it was Samuels and Associates, and UC Berkeley did this study. Um, 14 school districts. It was enough to be able to answer the question, are we going to lose a lot of money? And I think businesses and cities and hospitals with just a little bit, and you got to take in all the inputs and all the outputs too, right? You got the electricity that's got to keep those vending machines going, you've got some healthcare costs. To be able to show that you're not going to lose a lot of money is going to be enough to, yeah. I think, assuage um, some doubt. Jim, I, I agree, say, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's the moral argument fails in our, I'll give you a case study from we're dealing with in Seattle right now where the school district is considering 
accepting corporate sponsorships again, and particularly from the beverage industry, who's the one knocking on its door. And they make the moral argument that our education is suffering. We can't give people access to physical activity. We need this revenue, and it's, if we can't get it from other sources because the state's going broke, this is the way we're going to serve our kids. And so they, there's the moral argument, I think, needs to be buttressed by some of the arguments about you're not going to lose revenues and, you, and about this. And I think it, you've got to take both, both tactics with it. Jim, I totally agree. I think we are obligated to speak their language. And you know, whether if we're approaching the education community, we have to speak their language. If we're approaching the business community, we need to be able to speak their language. Too often, we think our health messages are going to sway the day. Yep. The moral argument is going to sway the day, and that's it's not enough. And I, and I think you're absolutely right. We do need to buttress it. And I also think we're obligated to do better evaluation of our policy implementation. We really do need to evaluate what works and what doesn't. And we often don't do a good enough job of that. And you know, 80% of policy is implementation, and often we'll pass regulation or pass legislation or initiate a policy, and it doesn't, you know, we don't actually get it implemented fully. So there's so much into, into this that we have to take into account. Hi, excellent, uh, excellent presentation. Uh, I'm Jeff Willett. Vice President for Programs with the Kansas Health Foundation. And until February of this year, I was the director of the New York State Tobacco Control Program. I guess um, I just want the, um, the panel's reaction to um, how research and advocacy around sugar-sweetened beverage taxes can you know, reflect kind of the, what we've learned about tobacco tax implementation. In New York State has the highest tobacco taxes in the country. A pack of cigarettes has a pack, uh, tax of $4.65. The city has an additional $1.50. Over the last decade, uh, rates of tobacco use in New York State have declined uh, and have declined at, at rates faster than the national average. But we've seen uh, a lot of tax evasion. We've seen the industry reduce prices before a tax goes into effect. We've seen increase in price promotions, coupons, discounting, all to kind of get folks through those first few weeks or months of a tax increase so that they maintain addiction, continue using the products. So with sugar-sweetened beverages, with, with industries that have a much broader product line to spread costs out across, and with cheaper alternatives, you know, generic sodas and so on, available that, pre, that uh, provide lower cost alternatives for price sensitive individuals. I just wonder what your reaction is to how we can implement a sugar sweetened beverage tax that from the outset will have an actual significant increase on the price of the product in relation to healthier options. Um, just maybe just to start on design, one, one thing that's really important is that the tax needs to be a function of quantity and not price. So the, the way we, what we have right now across uh, 35 states is that we have sales taxes so that when you have quantity discounting, so if a 20 ounce is 99 cents and a two liter bottle is 99 cents, you've got the same amount of tax. If you've got a tax where it's an excise tax and it's per uh, ounce and it's a penny per ounce or two per ounce, then if you're selling twice the amount, you're paying twice the amount of tax. So that's, that's particularly important. The other thing about a sales tax is that you pay it when you check out and we really want that tax to be embedded at the shelf price so it's got to be prior to getting to the cash register. You don't want people making decisions, putting $100 worth of groceries in their cart and then when they get to check out they don't really have a sense of where that tax is being applied because the whole idea is actually to change behavior and not just raise uh, revenue. Um, of course, there may be, you know, um, I've heard some folks from Coke saying, well, we'll spread the tax over our diet and our non-diet, but eventually, um, or, you know, we'll spread it over our bottled water, but eventually there are going to be companies perhaps that are selling water only, and they are not going to be spreading the tax because they are not paying the tax. So there, you know, eventually there's going to be a market clearing price and an equilibrium and a race to the bottom because people will suss out the cheaper products. So it may take some time, and there may be some of that over time, uh, but I think as the public becomes aware, and if the tax is large enough, the public is going to expect not to have that tax on the non-sugar sweetened beverage products. And so I my name is Ann Fonfa. I run Annie Appleseed Project. We're a nonprofit for people with cancer. Uh, I have a grave concern about the idea of uh, the diet soda 
because it doesn't have sugar doesn't mean it's a healthy product. And I think we're going to push people toward that, and that's going to cause other health ailments. It's not just obesity that's killing our people. That's a grave concern. Two of the speakers did talk about combining um, the combination of risks. If we increase, and, and we have to do this, we have to increase physical activity, we have to um, increase consumption of real food because we don't have that in the U.S. And, and we have to be aware that if we drive people toward unsweetened soda, we're going to be killing them with the, pro you know, animals are dying from carcinogenic ingredients in diet soda. And we can't pretend that doesn't matter because they're just animals. That's what our research community is about. Very concerned. Talk about diet soda. Um, you know, I, I, I agree that the topic of uh, diet beverages is uh, an area that uh, requires much more research. Um, we actually have a, our group has a, a four-year, $2 million NIH grant to look at that question, to compare three groups, a group with sugar-sweetened beverages to a group of unsweetened beverages, but a third group including artificially sweetened beverages. And then we'll be looking at outcomes over a year. Um, I think the early, you know, the concern that the, the florid cancer risk with some of the earlier artificial sweeteners hasn't borne out in recent studies. In, in other words, that there, there's no strong evidence of a clear, direct, increased risk for cancer. But that doesn't mean that there's no risk, nor does it mean that it's a healthful product. There's a lot of reason for concern, actually. One is that uh, fat cell receptors, the fat cells in the body, turn out to have taste receptors, just the same kind of sugar receptors that we have in our mouth. So what are those doing there? Well, you know, they're promoting fat cell differentiation and proliferation, and they can be stimulated by the concentrations of artificial sweetener, which would be obtained by just drinking a couple of 12-ounce diet beverages a day. Raises artificial sweeteners circulating in the blood high enough to stimulate those taste receptors on fat cells. And maybe that's one reason why uh, diet sodas in some studies have been linked to excessive weight gain. Um, the other concern I have is that um, these hyper, so artificial sweeteners, many of them, interestingly, were discovered quite accidentally and typically in the search for pesticides. Um, there's one great story in which one artificial sweetener was being uh, worked on, I think it was in the 50s or 60s in London, by a British senior scientist and his Eastern Indian um, junior colleague. And they were trying to develop a new pesticide. The senior scientist told the Indian fellow, um, go test this new compound, and the guy, in he, he heard, go taste it. <laughs> True story. He tasted it, and it was just revoltingly sweet. Um, and after the professor got over his shock that, uh, <laughs> that the guy actually did that, you know, he, you know, they got very excited about the possibility of this, this not a pesticide, but, uh, and, um, uh, and other of these compounds have been discovered in similar ways. They're hundreds to thousands of times sweeter than sugar. They hyper-stimulate the taste receptors. These receptors have an intimate communication with parts of the brain that regulate body weight and other autonomic pathways. We just don't know what the long term is. I think clearly the bottom line for me is that for an obese individual, a diet beverage is better than a sugar-sweetened beverage, but should be considered a transitional beverage until we have better long-term data, um, with the safest beverage being unsweetened or traditionally sweetened. I mean, human cultures for thousands of years have been, you know, hundreds of years at least, have been putting in a little bit of sweetener, you know, a teaspoon of sugar into coffee. But that amounts to no more than one gram per ounce. And I think up to that level, we probably can manage it. But a typical sugar-sweetened beverage has three times that. Yeah, I think it's actually a place where there's room for a lot more research, which is what are some healthy alternatives that, that people like the taste of, that isn't highly sweetened, that doesn't have artificial sweeteners in it. There are now some new products on the market, I don't know how widely available they are, that have mint essence and chocolate essence. I mean, I don't know what consumers think of those. 
Um, but I think there's a lot of room to find. I'm sure the beverage companies are probably um, testing those right now. This is an interesting story um, related to sort of following up with policy research and evaluation. So we had um, the folks from Steward Health System at an event that we did. Steward is in Boston, and they, they had multiple hospitals that were involved in um, the Boston campaign around reducing sugary beverages in hospitals. And they had one hospital that banned sugary beverages and one hospital that did a lot of other more subtle strategies, changed pricing, changed placement, that sort of thing. And in the, in the hospital that banned the sugary beverages, do you remember him talking about this at our symposium? The one that banned the sugary beverages, um, the, the amount of what were yellow beverages, so the diet beverages and, and that sort of stuff, drink consumption went way up, whereas in the hospital that did the sort of more subtle things, they didn't have that same increase in, in the diet beverages and so on, and they had a better increase in the waters and other sort of what were, you know, called green beverages on the sort of red, green, yellow, stoplight kind of, a, of an approach. So, you know, there's some interesting, I don't know what that is around consumer behavior and, and behavioral economics and I don't know what all else that would be very helpful to get more of that kind of information about how do you, how do you implement policy in a way that is effective. And most generally, I think we all agree that, that considering potential unintended consequences is an important part of, of the policy uh, perspective, of course. So I think we have to stop now. We're, we're past our time, and I know at least one of the panel members has to uh, take off. But uh, most of us will be around to talk more after this. And we thank you all for uh, coming, and uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um.